Okay. So this is our actually our fourth lunch and learn um, that we've offered, and Susan Deus has graciously agreed to come and talk to us about art at the bedside. Um, and we're Holly. I don't know if you heard, but we're just going to go around and introduce ourselves, um, our name, where we are, what organization we're connected with, if we're connected with one, and what you're hoping to get from today's lunch and learn. So I'm just going to start. Um, my name is Mary Ann Brody, and I'm the executive director of Crossroads of Caring. I'm also a certified clinical pastoral educator with ACPE. Um, I'm here in Rochester, New York, and I am really excited to hear from Susan because she has presented to our clinical pastoral education classes about um, art, using art as a tool for helping us develop observational skills. But I haven't heard her talk about how she uses art in her spiritual care. So I'm really excited to experience that with her and how she uses the visual arts. And I'm gonna um, invite everyone. So um, Jen, how about you go first since you were first? Yeah, sure. Um, I am the palliative, the community palliative care social worker at Care First. And I, I, I'm going to second what Marianne had stated. I'm just excited to hear how um, art is being utilized um, in, I think, all aspects of the psychosocial um, with bedside. So I can possibly use that with the patients that I work with. Stephanie, how about you? Thanks, Jen. So I'm Stephanie Sauve and um, recently retired from academia and uh, with two of my former students right now and um, just enjoying this season. Um, Presbyterian clergy, recent graduate of a CPE program has served at the Hildebrandt uh, for that. And um, I'm just really always looking for another way to invite um, a, a deepening experience with people and, um, to move people out of their body and into the into the world a little bit and invite some creative energy. So um, this just really appealed to me and I wanna hear how there can be more at the bedside that is not just about the body. Thanks, Stephanie. And Holly? Good morning. So um, I'm Holly and I also work at Care First. Um, and I am currently the clinical support specialist. Uh, and I was really interested in this both from a personal and professional um, aspect because I, I'm a creative person at heart, um, but also to be able to expand upon my professional skill set to, like Jen said, bring this to the folks that you know, we um, uh, work with and support you know, within Care First. So I'm really excited just to, just to see how I can you know, bring some of my own skills and and hopefully expand upon on what you teach us today. Thanks, Holly. All right, Susan, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself okay. um, and start us on this journey. Um, thanks, Marianne. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. And yes, um, I have to acknowledge that, yes, Marianne and I have worked together now for a number of years, mm -hmm. uh, introducing um, looking at art as part of a CPE curriculum. And um, it's based on the practice that, I'm, that I've used there is actually called art and observation. And the practice was developed specifically for training medical students. And I began working on that over 20 years ago. It subsequently expanded into, at least in my work, into the broad reaches of, of the field of healthcare. So that's this using art to explore how we see and how we look and ultimately how we see, which is both external and internal. And it's really the internal that I'm um, especially interested in. And Stephanie, I'm going to reflect on this concept of the body as um, something that certainly within medicine and nursing, the 
students and practitioners are caring for the body, um, it's body focused a lot of the experience of self-knowledge that, um, that I work with. So I'm really going to be interested in exploring that with, with all of you. Um, my first course of CPE I did, oh my gosh, 20 years ago as well, um, at Strong Hospital. And I um, so love CPE that when I had to turn in my badge at the end of my internship year, I was distraught. I didn't know what to do. I was working full time, raising kids pretty much on my own. Um, and I wasn't quite sure how I was going to return to working at the bedside. So somehow forces converged and what I combined um, after my internship experience in CPE is um, a program that I called Art at the Bedside. I used my years of working at the Memorial Art Gallery as head of the education department and especially interested in um, connecting people with themselves and with each other through art um, to create a program. So it's a combination of my work as a medical, as a museum educator and with patient care that I developed Art at the Bedside. And for a number of years, um, I started uh, somewhere in 2008, I launched it in 2009 um, at the, in the palliative care unit at Strong Hospital. Um, and then through connections there, I came every Friday, I got release time from my museum work to actually explore and develop this program. And so it began in palliative care, and then it extended to various um, aspects of the Wilmont um, Cancer, it used to be Cancer Center, it's now Cancer Institute, um, especially bone marrow transplant, because that's a place where individuals are often in the hospital for extended periods of time, as you all know. And so um, that's where it came from. It came from a putting together of both my museum work, working with objects, and it warms my heart to hear about the creative souls that have joined today and an exploration of clay after many years. Um, I, I also identify as creative, um, but not as an artist. I believe that my creativity is, um, is really inspired by being with, um, with people, with art, and that's where my connectivity and creativity really resides. So that's the background for Art at the Bedside. I have an article that I wrote a number of years ago that's in the Journal of Pastoral Care and Counseling, and Marianne, I'm going to give it to you later um, so that you can send folks the link. Um, you can get it through PubMed and so, um, but it's, it's really will introduce you to Art at the Bedside. What I'm doing and prepared for you all is I've distilled um, the experience, I hope, um, in a slide presentation, which I think um, I'm gonna share my screen and share with you just the structure of how I think it might be possible to use works of art as gateways, gateways to um, various kinds of connections and conversations. So let me go to that. All right. Ever challenging, and I apologize. Um, All right. Are you, you're just seeing my setup screen, right? For, yes. with the left hand sides. Um, if you're all right with that, 
um, I tried to get it set up. I have three screens here and I'm really not skilled. So I'm just looking and making sure that you all can see. You're all right. Okay, great. All right. So um, one of the first things I learned is that people have an allergy to the word art. Oh, I'm not creative. Oh, I'm, uh, no, I, I don't like art. So when I'm thinking about art at the bedside now, um, it would be closer to pictures at the bedside. So that people, um, pictures enter into all of our worlds, whether they're photographs, whether they're picture books. So that's actually a transition that I would make um, now. It definitely is art-based. And it's definitely a practice that evolved in partnership with, uh, with the patients that I worked with over the years. So, so Art at the Bedside pictures as gateways. And these are what I, let's see. Ah. Can you see this now or did I mess it up for you completely? No, we can see the slide. Okay, all right. So gateways to facilitate connections, to change the environment, to inspire memories and to begin difficult conversations. I really, you can see all of you with um, palliative care, experience, difficult conversations are an essential part of that work, but they're not the only part. So that's why I'll get to that last. But everything that the, the reason why I think this works is, um, and I am gesturing um, in language, but to Parker Palmer, and let me just, I'm, I have to look to the left. So forgive me if it looks like I'm not looking at you to see you. Are you all familiar with Parker Palmer's The Third Thing? And if not, that's, that's fine. No, okay. Yeah. Okay, you are, Stephanie, you are. And I know Marianne, you are. Um, all right, Jen and Holly, I couldn't recommend Parker Palmer with greater enthusiasm. He is um, a Quaker educator a spiritual voice. Um, he's been connected with uh, Kristen Tippett's On Being, if you're familiar with that, for, um, for many years. He introduced the concept of the third thing when speaking about how to encourage the soul to come into a conversation. And he speaks of it as the soul as shy, that it has to be invited in. And the invitation is often easiest or easier, I'm gonna say easier, if you're not necessarily looking right at an individual, but the people in conversation are actually looking at a third thing. Um, I'm going to also just look at you all again. Do you have any memory of a conversation perhaps with um, young ones in your life that were possible because you were driving and someone was sitting in the seat beside you and it doesn't have to be a young person um, and you were looking at the road but not at each other and conversation unfolded with an ease that it doesn't when it's eye to eye. Is that familiar? Okay, so yes. I think, thanks. Um, that's, that's the idea. And that's sort of the, the experience that many of us have had uh, over the course of lifetime, either being in the driver's seat or in the passenger seat. And so, the third thing in this case, and it's used in different ways, um, in this art at the bedside um, or pictures as 
gateways is using art. So with that, I really would like to invite you into looking at some of these pieces together. And one of the, I'm using the same kinds of structure that I used in the hospital as a chaplain um, and tried to distill what was happening in a hospital setting. Um, how can we change the environment? So we can go for a walk in the woods. And just, I'm going to um, please unmute yourself. I'd love to hear just looking at this, just thoughts. I'm seeing this log in the foreground right by a little, um, it looks like a little bit of water and a wonderful way to kind of look out through the forest and see this framing of, of a vista. Okay. So a lovely place to sit and rest and look at the next, what, what's coming next. All right. So a foreground, the log, and then an invitation to go into the distance. Stephanie, thank you. Holly, what do you see? It, the visual gives me a very calming feeling, but I almost can hear what you would expect to hear in being in this place. Um, you know, whether it be birds chirping or even that water kind of trickling, you know, through, um, but it's just a very, calming scene for me. Okay. So isn't it interesting? It's absolutely, it's a projected image. And yet the invitation is visual as well as auditory. So you're bringing yourself into this picture and that's the invitation. Susan, I'm really drawn toward the light the light on the water, the light on that tree, the light at the end of the path, and um, okay. those light spaces that are, I don't know, I look at them and I feel hopeful. Yeah, so but light, um, yeah, keep, yeah. So light, um, there's something about it that can lighten us. This is where, I work with the body itself in terms of that light, how it might actually infuse lightness as well. And just the way you, Marianne, just looked at the light first here, but then drew our eyes up the tree trunk as well as to the vista that Stephanie, you mentioned first off. I'm not sure, Jen, if you're still there. So I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. Maybe not. Okay. Any thoughts? This gave me an immediate warm feeling because of the color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, you know, lightening or warming, it's, these pictures are really invitations to experience them internally. Thanks. And I heard the water. I heard the water running down all of the levels and, and I felt lifted up as my eye was drawn up. Um, to this kind of embracing uh, forest mm -hmm. that is, you know, and kind of covering, but yet again, framing, inviting me to, to go up to the higher levels there. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yes. I, I was immediately uh, first 
I love the Lord of the Rings, that whole series. And I looked at that and I thought, we're, we're in Rivendell <laughs> with the waterfalls coming down and the trees reaching over. And I thought about elves, like it, it regularly transported me to a different place, like in, in a different, um, a fantasy world, which, you know, I find very intriguing and adventurous. And I don't know, I guess I can imagine if I couldn't do those things now, it would be very pleasant to think about being in a place where I could kind of live vicariously. So referencing really changing the environment. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I had to learn when I first started doing Art at the Bedside is that it wasn't about me. Um, when people said, uh, no thanks. I don't want to do this. And, you know, I was with people who were really, I mean, palliative care, of course, we all know what that setting is. And one of the things that I learned um, was one of the few things that people in those settings can do is say no. There are many things they can't say no to, but this was one of them. So I'm very aware of that hearing this and the first time it worked and memorable in, mem in memory is when someone said the fourth floor in palliative care it's strong she said you just took me for a walk in the woods and So it can change the environment. And there's something about these images. And yes, they're in part chosen quite, I mean, carefully um, to invite people in. And so they're way in. Jen, one of the things we were just looking at is just looking at a couple of the images that I've used over time. And I'd love to hear, just looking at this picture, um, what you're seeing and feeling looking at it. I have a deep connection with nature to begin with. So this gives me a sense of peace and like deep joy in my, so, I, I, it, it does, it makes me want to take a walk through the woods and admire all the beauty. It's, it's so, it's so powerful, this third thing, how it invites, um, and I'm using Parker Palmer's language again, it, it invites the shy soul to, to, walk with us and perhaps walk um, more with more awareness for us on the, the surface of where we live. So thank you. Thank you. So I want to take you through a number of these images so that we eventually get to um, pictures that can be used in many different ways. Um, if anyone wants to say something, please chime in. Otherwise I might just move us along a little bit. I'm looking at, at this and I'm wondering, is the storm coming or is the storm leaving? Yeah. I think the first word that came to me was like trials. Mm -hmm. 
Could you say a little bit more about trials? Um, it appears as though the people are walking down the path, but closer in the visual, it looks like there's a lot of debris or there's like obstruction and the path isn't really that clear. Okay. Yeah, and I think that explains a lot of things that we all experience in life and that debris in those those barriers can look different for each of us but eventually we get to a part in the path where it's not so obstructed and there's some clearing some clearing in the sky some clearing in after the trial Looks like we lost her. Yeah, I'm, I think she's talking about that. obstructions, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think she'll be back. So I'm going to wait for her to yeah. Yeah. come back in. It seemed like she it was struggling a little bit. Her yeah. Connection. Yeah. Her video, for yeah, sure. Her, and I was losing a few words from time to time. Now, this is so fascinating, right? I mean, I just you see the image and it's just like right. You know, you have to, your mouth needs to catch up with where your mind is going. I, it's just so much, you know, happening. You know, I have to, oh, go ahead, Mary. No, go ahead, Jen. Um, it reminds me, I don't know if, if you had seen it recently, but I've been sucked into um, Bob. Oh, why did I just lose his name? Help me. Say good. No, we didn't know. No, that's not Bob. Oh my goodness. Uh, the painter. Ross? Um, Thank you. Yes, Bob Ross. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I've been sucked into like watching him lately. And it's just, I think I view him in a completely different way of like the miracle person that he was for so many people. Mm. through television yeah you know and I they had I don't know if any of you have watched the documentary on him but mm. they had a lot of people saying how he inspired through his show he inspired them to start painting like in their home with him through yeah. tv and yeah. the changes and in their life that that had taken for them it was hmm. it's just very cool oh that's really awesome yeah he's like almost magical isn't he I mean you know yeah. it looks like nothing's happening there and then all of a sudden there's this amazing uh image that has yeah been, yeah yeah and he kind of I, I haven't watched him but from what I've heard other people say is he kind of creates as he goes along and things emerge and if it's, it's, it's like, there are no mistakes, there are happy opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so like, whatever comes out is what's meant to come out. Yes. Right. So that's a good for, that's good for your clay too. Cause yeah. that's, that's true about working with clay. Yeah. Thank I've you. always wanted to try that. Yeah. Yeah. It wants to emerge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome back. Hi, Thank Susan. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it's wonderful that we have this technology. And it's, you know, I, I don't know how many times, you know, you put caps lock on for the numbers and just type whatever comes out and just non anxious presence, right? Those Absolutely. are words you all know. Absolutely. So let's try again. So I was listening to somebody and they said the, the technological glitches give you doorways for other connections. So <laughs> yeah. we had a lovely conversation when you were gone. It, you right. know, and we'll, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's it's opportunity. It's a Indeed. moment to Indeed. be embraced, not to be threatened by. No, exactly. And Jen, I think this, you know, I'm just gonna segue from what you were just saying about 
just the logs in the road. We just had to go over logs in the road. Absolutely. And we're, um, I hope, fingers crossed, going back to, can you see this again? Not yet. Not yet. Hold on. Your video seems to freeze every once in a while. Like now. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There's your PowerPoint up. Yay. All right. Beginning. You can see it. It told me that Zoom um, just quit. Yes. But you can see the PowerPoint again now. You can see the PowerPoint. Yeah. Your, your image is frozen. Okay, that's what happened the last time. You know, it's, I will say, it's one of the humbling, and maybe it's humiliating, but humbling parts of this process to see yourself all the time. So um, I'm going to move down. Can you see? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the, the choice once again, and it is the natural world, I'm going to just, most of these, um, I think actually none of these are in the collection of the Memorial Art Gallery, but I had permission from this amazing resource, and I'm imagine that you all could use it too, called Art Store. And I, for, um, in my case, I mean, it's educational or not-for-profit um, use, you have access to amazing images. I will say that when I started this, Google, Google Images was not what it is now. That's another source for you if you wanted to, to gather images, to use them with the, the patients or the clients that you work with. So let me just quickly go through a few of these. Um, inspire memories. This started, yes, it was already in memories that you were sharing um, that we were looking at with the natural world. This actually started with um, being in a room with, um, in a hospital room, and that um, the individuals and their family had brought in photographs mm. and they were by the bedside. And with permission, I began to really explore um, with people, just looking at the pictures that they brought and they would introduce me to the individuals. I, I imagine that's something that you all have done as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, Mary. Sorry to interrupt. Always. Could, could you play it from the current slide? That makes the picture a little bit bigger. Oh, yay. Thank you. Hold on. Thank you. Thank you. Did that work? Oh, I think it, I didn't see a change. Hold on two seconds. Let me try something else. Um, I'm going to just make it bigger this way. Can is this bigger? Yeah, a little bit. Losing. We're losing. Yeah, but we lose parts of it. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's um, okay. I can also send you, Marianne, I can I'll send you the article link and I'll also send you a link to these these pictures, the ones that I chose. Okay. So you all could see them later. So this is not about art history, even though if people wanted to, they have engaged in conversations about um, who the artist is, if they're curious. One very, um, one individual who was quite young had, um, had a child with her at in palliative care. And they had were looked at pictures of mothers and babies before she entered into the hospital. So when I showed them this, um, 
it was it was a, a gateway to talking about things that were before the hospital. Hmm. One of the challenges of, and I, I hope this shifted to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good, good, thanks. Um, James Vanderzee was a photographer um, who was worked in Harlem and was a dominant voice in um, recording the, the, the life of individuals around him in Harlem. Diversity is a really vital part of the images that are chosen. It was something that working very closely over the years with Robin Franklin, who's head of chaplaincy services at Strong Hospital, we've spoken about and to always be aware of having images that look like the individuals you're working with. So um, this portrait, he had a portrait studio in Harlem of um, a mother with two children is among the images. I, I actually brought all of these images into the hospital room and I had multiple, uh, about oh, 10 or 12 different categories. And then I had them divided up into 10 or 12 different images per category, and this was mothers and children, and went through the, just let people stop when they wanted mm. to talk about something, to say something. I, I know my, the screen is frozen again, so, but can you still see? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep, we can see. All right. One of the messages for me, also working in an art museum, is, um, Yes, there is a Norman Rockwell painting at the Memorial Art Gallery, and there is a museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, dedicated to Norman Rockwell, this extraordinary voice, a visual um, representation of America from the 20s, really through the 70s. It is not everybody's America. It is some individual's America. And that was something that I really tried to listen not, not tried, yes, of course I listened. I tried to do my best that when I would visit people again, which was often the case, that I listened to those pictures that they liked the best. One person just loved a picture of Barnes. And the next time I came with lots and lots of pictures of Barnes. Someone had the most fabulous tattoos. And we talked first about her tattoos. And then the next week I brought in a collection of tattoos for mm, her. Nice. So it's really a partnership with individuals. And silence isn't all that easy on Zoom because maybe it means um, the connection has been broken, but silence is absolutely an essential part of chaplaincy. And just waiting. Once again, to use Parker Palmer's words, it, for the shy soul to speak, it takes time to see, 
and it takes time to speak and to give people time. There's a whole protocol for um, engaging in difficult conversations that um, medical students often entering in their mid twenties um, who've had very little lived, mostly just learned experience. So how to engage in difficult conversations. And that's absolutely an essential part of, as you all know, of chaplaincy. So these have, these are, you'll see, and I'll go through and please chime in if there's anyone that you'd like to speak about. I think the image before um, over the turkey dinner, that, that for me looks like an invitation to have conversation. I know there's like some gleefulness on people's faces, but I'm, I was so intrigued by the fact that hardly anybody's looking at the turkey and the presenter of the turkey, that they are, they're really having their own conversations across this table. And um, my experience when meeting with a family around a bedside is that there are lots of conversations happening and it's hard to get somebody focused on the main event. Um, that is coming before us. Um, so this woman is presenting her her life work here, the work of several days, and um, and they're like, this person wants wants to make mugging for the picture, and and there's you know, I mean, there's people that are this looks like these this couple is having a little cross conversation, and so I that that one kind of began to talk about difficult conversations for me or the challenge of having a conversation. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Stephanie, for bringing us back to this one. It doesn't have to be um, an illustration of a difficult conversation. This really is, is a perfect invitation and often as we all know, the last person who is included in the conversation may be the person in the bed. Right, yeah. And um, all of the crosstalk is great. I will never see this image ever again in the same way. And that's the other part of this amazing practice is that we, we really shape each other's connections. So thank you. Any other thoughts? Hmm. So chime in, because I'm, I'm looking also at the clock and I wanted just to do a, a wrap up with you all. I think for me, both of those images are, are reflect um, how scattered things. I mean, everything seems to be blown apart, and and um, and you know the the leaves are here, there, and everywhere. Um, uh, you know, and the difficult conversation is kind of like bringing those pieces together so that people can feel some sense of connection, um, and um, and yet things do come all apart, and there's a beauty in that. And, and the dispersing of the pieces as well. Thanks. I think the first word that comes to mind for me on this, and Stephanie, I really appreciate your perspective on that. I wouldn't have looked at it that way, but I see that certainly. Um, and I also, it's, it's a reflection. So, to me, that's the first word that came, comes to mind is kind of reflecting upon, you know, maybe what it is that needs to be discussed um, and working through that. Um, but that's, yeah, reflection is what I first thought of here. Absolutely. 
Um, for me, the first thing that came to my mind was um, murky, because I think a lot of times when we're working with patients and families, um, next steps or next conversations can appear murky and not knowing, you know, and the fear of that, of, of not knowing and, um, and the direction. So when things are murky, it's hard to move forward. And I guess what I noticed first were the leaves on the surface and how it's easy to stay on the surface, but in the back, there are those, the reflection of the, I guess there are tree trunks that go down that seem to go deep. So there are the surface things and there are the deep things and the deep things are in the light, which I'm still pondering. <laughs> That's beautiful. Wow, I can just blow my mind that, thank you for sharing that. That's really good stuff. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Fred Rogers. Um, we just had a didactic Bill Reynolds did and he talked about Fred Rogers comment that anything mentionable is manageable. Uh, oh, I like that. And the challenge is to have it mentioned. Right and how to have a space that's safe. And that's where these objects can, once again, be a starting point. And all that you've said, once again, it's a transformed image for me. Um, so thank you. Many things that I would say, and I'm just gonna hold on to go through the next couple of images. I was thinking in that last image, we're talking about difficult conversations, but those trees look so orderly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't think those conversations are that orderly. <laughs> now, this to me speaks to maybe the changes, you know, that are ahead mm -hmm. with in that conversation. You know, the leaves have fallen, the seasons are changing, you know, that that's... crossroads yeah. <laughs> the same word came to mind yeah yeah with the impending storm again coming or going though <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah but so much growth there in the back right yeah all that growth coming up from the earth the build up the build up too yeah good point holly I'm not sure what this reminded me of Highway to Heaven. I, I'm mm. not sure. <laughs> I think about like our journey as individuals, no one knows the journey that you walk, even if they're walking alongside of you, because their perspective is going to be completely different. Their experiences are going to be completely different. So I think in life, we all have our own individualized 
journey and walk that we take. Mm. Sometimes it can feel alone. Yeah, that was my word. I guess I, I felt like alone and, and I think because of the, the, the way it's shaded, um, it, it just feels a little heavy to me. Yeah. It feels heavy and uh, uncertain because things are out of focus yeah. off the lighted path. And yet the, the body looks erect and doesn't look burdened. <laughs> it's just very confident almost. Uh, kind of inquisitive in shape for me, hmm. um, almost as if it's looking out to hmm. the, the dark shaded part. And I think a lot of times like, if we are experiencing something, we want to pull in the dark, like the dark side of things to take the journey with us. But sometimes finding that communication to explain what we're experiencing is difficult. It makes me wonder too, if there's some value or some importance that we place on staying on the lighted path mm. and kind of keeping the darkness at bay, keep the darkness off to the side. Um, Cause I've been wondering, is he coming? It almost looks like the ground comes up. And I wondered if the figure was walking up a hill or walking down a hill or just standing like with their arms out yeah. or carrying something yeah and and yet there's the right center so they're like owning this path <laughs> you know right. there's a balance or there's a you know I, Susan, this is wonderful conversation. I just want to remind you, we have about three minutes. I just look, but Marianne, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Hmm. So we could go on and on. And hmm. and this actually is the the last image. And so I'm going to, I will send you Marianne everything as, as promised. Okay. Let me stop sharing and see if possibly, um, I don't think my screen for some reason, I'm not quite sure what happened. But there it is. Um, so I'd love to hear just the two minutes that we have left and to continue this conversation in a sense for you all is how might you use in the work that you're doing? How might you use images? Any thoughts at this point? I think. For me, it would almost be a tool to have for those patients that, uh, you know, we're trying to develop a relationship with, develop that rapport, those that struggle to kind of get in touch with, you know, that side of them that we're really trying to connect with to be able to support them. Uh, so I really feel that that would kind of create that conversation um, in getting them to to start talking in some way, shape or form. Yeah, yes. 
So not to specific ends, but to actually begin to begin. Right. I'm not currently serving in a setting where I would use that, but I, um, this feels like permission giving. I mean, I have a retreat, a women's retreat coming up and I'm thinking, oh, I need to bring images to that retreat. So, um, so I'm seeing a broader application in the pieces that I'm doing. And so I thank you for that. I think for me, it kind of opens the opportunity and the door to um, present images to those I work with that has the capability of really unlocking the subconscious a little bit more. And I'm putting together some online um, courses and I just, I'm just putting something together around cultural humility. And I thought, hmm, I could use, I could probably find some really good images to put up there and have, have students respond to them. Well, Marianne, thank you for the invitation and thank you all for so generously engaging in this practice. I'm a uh, I'm always um, not amazed, I'm not amazed, but I'm grateful. I'm really grateful to have the chance to, to really meet with others. Um, I've done it in museums and now this is its own, its own gift. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, this is a gift. Yes, thank you so much. Well, thank you.